Hi, everybody. I am so excited to be introducing someone to you all. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but in my field and practice and all that I do, I meet a lot of amazing people. And I'm about to introduce you to one of them. Her name is Carly Jackson, also known as Naturally Carly from her Lifestyle and Nutrition YouTube channel. She's a holistic nutrition and weight loss coach with an extensive background in plant-based nutrition, human psychology, and behavior modification techniques. Now, we all need this, right? Because we all have things we're trying to change and trying to stop, and we want to do good things, but we don't do good things, and we don't want to do bad things, but we do bad things. So Carly specializes in helping ill and overweight individuals as well regain their health through evidence-based lifestyle and dietary interventions with an emphasis on whole food plant-centered nutrition. She holds certificates in both plant-based nutrition and food addiction. And I have placed her contact information uh, below the video here so that you can check out all the amazing things she does. Hopefully you'll go to her YouTube channel and you'll, you'll uh, subscribe so that you can see everything and you won't miss anything good. So Carly is here today. She is going to cover a subject that many people have questions about. And so I'm going to disappear. She's going to show you some amazing information on her slides. And then we'll do maybe a little question or two after. All right. Here she comes. Thanks, Eileen. I'm so honored to be the first guest you have on your show. So I know that much of your audience is not necessarily going to resonate with the whole food plant-based or even plant-based in general um, approach to their diet. But I want to provide a, a comprehensive view of what the research shows as far as optimal nutrition and a manner of reducing chronic pain and living our best life, essentially, because in so many different ways, I know you emphasize in your other videos and across your platform, how helpful these, um, you know, high antioxidant, high anti-inflammatory reducing foods um, that are involved in this, this uh, overall dietary pattern can be really helpful for reducing chronic pain. So, and of course, um, being overweight or obesity and all of the inflammatory factors that go into play with that is definitely on everybody's mind too, when they think about their joint health and their, um, their pain in general and reducing that as much as possible to live a better quality of life. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get into our first topic, which is food cravings. I want to talk about the major barriers when it comes to maintaining a healthy lifestyle of any kind, whether or not you really um, want to go all out with the whole food plant-based perspective, but that is where I'm coming from. That is what I, what I, um, uh, the major approach that I use with my clients, because that is where I see the best results. So I hope you can see my screen and let me present. There we go. All right, so let's talk about making your healthy diet stick, whatever that means to you. I don't want to be too dogmatic about the um, inclusions and exclusions of certain foods in this particular presentation. I'm specifically going to talk about how to overcome dietary setbacks produced by food cravings and emotional eating. So just in general, we're going to cover exactly what a craving is. I think um, demystifying this is really helpful for people. And then ultimately how to manage and eliminate those food cravings by creating a personalized craving management plan. And after we finish up with cravings, we're going to move into what is emotional eating, how to build self-awareness around this and building other tools for managing our emotions without turning to food. And then ultimately we all are trying to achieve food serenity. So we're going to just uh, touch base on that at the end. So when defining a craving, this really is not inherently good or bad. We always have a tendency to focus on this as a negative mechanism, but our bodies really don't know the difference. There is a huge, huge overlying mismatch between our environment and our biological constitution. 
So understanding that from a evolutionary perspective, I think is really helpful in getting to the bottom of what the heck is going on in my body when I just cannot quell these obnoxious food cravings. So simply thinking about this as a signal that we want something, because that's really all it is, whether it's something natural like food and water and shelter and oxygen, uh, fresh air, sunshine on our face. These um, are mechanisms to recalibrate our homeostasis. That's all it is. These are a survival mechanism that influence us to perform specific actions that lead to improvements in the likelihood of extending our lives and transferring our genes. Let's just call it what it is. So cravings have always served us well until the industrial revolution and the advent of things like these artificial processed foods, drugs, social media, gambling, so on and so forth. I think it's also helpful to differentiate between cravings that we have for artificial foods and cravings that we have for natural foods. So when I think of artificial food cravings, these are very specific and they're very intense. They're very extreme because of the extreme outcome that they have in our neurobiology. But when we think about natural foods, it's more of an internal desire to just need to nourish ourselves and quell our hunger drive as opposed to satisfying a specific craving. So cravings direct us to move, to physically get up and move toward the item for which we desire. This is only an issue when craving, again, these unhealthy modern man-made creations. So our cravings do not know the difference. So <laughs> I think just keeping that in mind in the back of your head is really helpful in not getting so judgmental and self-critical and hard on yourself. This is not a character defect. You are not flawed. This is your internal biology in a very mismatched environment. We were not designed to have this overabundance and highly affordable and highly stimulating food at our disposal, you know, from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to sleep at our home, at our work, at our um, gym, everywhere, at our hardware store. It's, it's really ubiquitous. So this is not a natural problem and we all suffer from it. Nobody is, um, you know, uh, going to escape <laughs> from this issue. So I think it's also helpful when I explain to my clients that cravings are derived from mental images of what the item, the action, or the experience looks like. Then we start to imagine what it feels like. So if you get rid of that mental imagery, essentially you get rid of the craving. The bodily sensations that result from the imagined experience are what we refer to as cravings. So this is just even the anticipation of what it's like to give in to your brownie or your cookies or your ice creams. Um, this is a primitive action to move us toward the thing that will satisfy that imagined experience. So some things that you might have experienced in the past when thinking about your food craving of choice or you know your, your trigger food of choice or whatever you wanna call it are things like salivating, or your stomach may start to growl, or um, this may also impact the release of digestive enzymes and different hormones. Your ghrelin, your leptin, your insulin, all of these things have a lot to do with how your brain is um, processing, you know, thoughts about food or, you know, what time of day it is, those kinds of things, different um, signals that we're sending to our body on basically when food is going to be coming in. So some other things you may experience are agitation, irritability, dis-ease, and of course, taste recollection. These are more oriented towards these unnatural foods um, as opposed to like the salivating and your stomach may growl. That may be in response to these more natural foods. But when you are responding to the extremes like the colorful candies at the grocery aisle or the um, the brownies or the uh, cheeseburgers on the way home. These are the things that you might experience when it comes to those. Euphoric recall 
is basically what I'm referring to. And it's the vivid recollection of past experiences with stimulating items or behaviors or otherwise. So consuming hyperpalatable food items is what I'm referring to specifically in this situation. When it comes to euphoric recall, we only recall the positive reinforcing memories and details of those memories. So I like to think this as analogous to a horrible breakup. Like think of a past boyfriend or girlfriend where you broke up with them or they broke up with you and all you could think about was all of the wonderful times that you spent together and oh gosh, it sounds like such a good idea to get back together with this person. Why do we ever break up in the first place? It's the same way with food. You forget about all of the nasty things that this food caused you every time that you gave into it. But for some reason, when we think about indulging in that food again, all we think about are all the positive aspects of that food. Oh, it was so good. And oh, I shared it with my friends. And oh, it was such a wonderful atmosphere and those kinds of things. So we do not recall the stomach aches, the brain fog, the lethargy, headaches, agitation, guilt, shame, embarrassment, and also the diabetes, the tooth decay, the heart disease, high blood pressure, all of these awful things that happen as a result of us giving into these hyperpalatable items or these unnatural processed man-made foods. But the good news is the more time that you accumulate between each of these indulgences, with these artificial foods, the less vivid these mental images and euphoric recall become. So soon all unnatural cravings will dissipate this in the same manner that they were created. All right, let's get into the nitty gritty of managing these cravings. Every time we give into a craving, it strengthens the connection in the brain and increases the likelihood of repeating it in the future. This is so essential to understanding how to overcome this problem because in the moment it seems so urgent and, and, and extreme, like we have to respond to it immediately. Otherwise the, the we're going to implode or something, but it really is not an urgent and it's really not as serious as a situation as we think. The trick is to use what we know about our neurochemistry to objectively recognize when these cravings take place and create space between ourselves and the typical tendency to just react mindlessly to these. And that's really the biggest distinction when it comes to, okay, I'm having a craving, what am I going to do with it? Like even having that pause to reconsider wait, I don't actually have to go reach toward that cookie. I can decide to do something else instead and redirect my behavior. Just having that pause is what we're looking for. So you want to use mindfulness practices to tap into your experience and get more intimate with it. Get really curious about what the heck is going on in my body when I do experience a food craving. Now, mindfulness can mean so many different things to so many different people. I'm basically just looking for an objective recognition and space that we're creating of what's going on. We're not judging the experience. We are not placing any importance on it or any personal um, dialogue or narrative when it comes to what's happening in our experience. We're just simply observing. We're simply being a scientist and investigating and getting curious about our experience. So this will ultimately demystify and reduce feelings of powerlessness over these awful cravings. You only need a few seconds of space or awareness to make a different, more informed decision. That's what we're looking for here. Not a mindless reaction, but an informed response. Do I really want to give in to this craving? Do I have to give in to this craving? What's going to happen if I don't? So instead of allowing yourself to get sucked in to that euphoric recall phenomenon, recognize that it is in fact happening now that you know what it is. And then redirect your attention. Override the urge to indulge in the fantasy to its full conclusion. This is, <laughs> this is very difficult, but it takes time, patience, and practice, and I promise you'll get there. Eventually, you'll notice exactly when you start to fantasize and romanticize about these these, these old familiar favorites that you used to have in your repertoire, your dietary repertoire. And you might start thinking about the last experience that you had with it. Who was there? Where were you? 
what was happening at the time. And then you start to think about the way that the food looks and smells and uh, the way it feels when you bite into it. But you want to cut that off <laughs> as soon as you recognize that it's happening instead of letting the um, the fantasy, you know, uh, carry out to its full conclusion. So memories fade with time, even those of chomping into a donut or a candy bar hundreds of times throughout our lifetime. Focus on accumulating time in between your last indulgence and the craving will naturally lose its power, its destructive influence, and its vivid experience attached to it. You will build new associations. This is the way with any new habit or think about any food that you've given up in the past for whatever reason, whether you, you know, had some sort of health issue or you were just sick of that obnoxious addiction or craving to that food. It's the same way. At first, it's very difficult, but after a few days, a few weeks, it gets easier and easier and easier. Same with quitting smoking, alcohol, gambling, any other behavior that it has not been serving you in the past that you have decided to um, you know, leave behind. So until you stop experiencing cravings, it may be counterproductive to tease your taste buds and rekindle the dopamine pleasure pathways with, um, within your brain. So I know nobody wants to hear this, but it is really helpful to remove all those artificial processed, you know, trigger foods at one time and replenish them with nourishing natural foods. This will naturally get rid of your food cravings. And then you don't have to use all these tricks and, you know, different mental gymnastics around like managing them. You can just get rid of them. And then, you know, you'll just have hunger and satiety hunger and satiety instead of when am I going to get this food again? I know where I saw it last. There were three left in my, in my pantry and my husband was eating those. And you know, how much should I have? When should I have it? It's exhausting <laughs> having those thoughts day in and day out. So building a personalized craving management plan is really helpful for anybody who feels obnoxious, preoccupations with food is kind of taking over their ability to show up at their job, in their family life, in their hobbies. Like it's hard for me to even, um, uh, when I was dealing with food cravings, it was hard for me to even uh, enjoy my time with my daughter when this was taking place, because you really are not present. You're not in the room at all. You're constantly focused on these uh, processed foods because they're so artificially stimulating. So basically this is a tool, the craving management plan is a tool for extinguishing cravings in the moment and as a preventative measure. So you really wanna um, tackle those two areas, the you know making sure you don't have any future cravings, but also um, having a tool in the moment to take care of them. So it's especially helpful in the early stages because you have to start somewhere and you can start small and that's, usually where sustainable habits start the first time in the first place. So this also includes implementation intentions. So this is just a plan. So when the inevitable, let's just call it X happens, here we're talking about a food craving, then I will do Y. So this could be anything. And this is why it's called a personal craving management plan. You really want to figure out what's going to work for you personally. So some people will, first and foremost, I always recommend taking a sip of water or even a glass of water because nine times out of 10 at cravings are just dehydration. We have this tendency to misinterpret a lot of the signals in our body for hunger when in fact they really are just telling us we need to um, take care of something else. Or maybe we're bombarded uh, just, you know, through our nervous system in some other manner. So some examples of other things that um, my clients have done in the past and that I have um, found a lot of research on the helpfulness of these strategies are things like extreme temperatures. I know this sounds really weird, but if you take a frozen bag of peas, let's say, and put it on the back of your neck or on your chest or on your wrists, it can um, kind of snap you out of it. And obviously you're so focused on, oh my God, there's this freezing cold thing on my body that it, it really helps you reset and um, redirect your attention. And, and sometimes like, as you notice throughout this presentation, we're just trying to build that space in between reacting and responding to this craving. 
So some of the things are vigorous bouts of exercise, like burpees and push-ups. I know everybody loves to do these things, but really just jumping in place for a few minutes can really help to get your heart rate up. And this also will reset your, um, your attention and that habit loop. You can also redirect to other senses. So thinking about different things in your immediate environment or um, what do you smell? What do you hear? What are, what are some other, you know, things that you're sensing on your body, like your clothing, your shoes, other surfaces you may be touching or some mental exercises, like name five things in my environment that start with the letter F or count backwards from a hundred by sevens or something. Those can be really helpful. All right. Now we're going to talk about a very probably well-known acronym. I definitely did not coin this. <laughs> HALT is hungry, angry, lonely, tired. You need to be well aware when you are experiencing any of these things because you are particularly vulnerable to giving into food cravings. So hunger, ultimately, make sure you're getting nourishing regular meals throughout the day and this won't be an issue. Um, angry, lonely, tired, getting more aware becoming more aware of your, um, your emotions is going to be your best tool for dealing with those. And we'll talk about that in the emotion, um, section coming up here. So soon you will be craving free. Yay. And just stick with your, um, craving management plan long enough to let nature run its course. This really does work every time. You just have to trust your body and trust the process. Craving healthy food. I think this is so important to note that it's not like craving artificial food or substances or you know other addictive habits and behaviors. It's like craving a good book, a snuggle with your child or the heat of a warm fireplace. I think if we think of it in those contexts of like our natural um, pleasurable experiences and our natural homeostatic mechanisms, it really helps us to get back on track with, yeah, I, I really don't like being food obsessed all the time and preoccupied with my candies and my desk drawer or something. All right, so let's shift gears a little bit to talk about this emotional eating tendency that a lot of people suffer with in our modern environment. Again, this is a huge mismatch between what our bodies were naturally designed for and what we're experiencing in our environment. We were not made to be bombarded with so much different stimuli throughout our day. We had a very simple life, food, shelter, sex, and taking care of our children. That, that was pretty much what we had to deal with. And, you know, obviously predators and um, uh, weather patterns and such. So having to make sure we make it to the meeting on time and pick up all a bunch of coffee for our, the people that we're working with and make sure that we have this big project done on time and pick up our kids after work and take care of ourselves. All of these things were never in our periphery until, you know, the advent of maybe, um, what, a hundred years ago. So this is Ultimately, emotional eating is the tendency for some to eat in response to a, a range of emotional desires. This could be anything from celebratory uh, aspects to, you know, sadness and even joy and happiness and excitement. We eat for all kinds of emotions. Feelings produce behaviors, actions, and thoughts that lead some to use food to numb, escape, or soothe. Basically, they use food as a drug. So very rare to do this with natural healthy foods. For instance, our ancestors likely did not suffer from this problem. Emotionally eating with healthy food, I just want to note this is a more progressive degree of food addictive behavior. It's what's known as a transfer addiction. So someone who used to be very um, kind of entrenched in the addictive patterns of eating a bunch of donuts or cookies or candies or you know pizza, whatever it was, and then trying to get off that food by overindulging in some kind of healthy food. Like I've worked with people who have done this with sweet potatoes and grapes and all a whole gamut, even cauliflower can become like oddly stimulating if we consume it in, you know, um, rather large quantities for certain individuals. This is all, both emotional eating and cravings are very genetically um, 
dependent. So, and also how much you've been exposed to these things throughout your lifetime, how much you were exposed to them in uh, not emotional eating, obviously, but the, um, the foods themselves, how much you've been exposed to them in the womb, in your infancy, throughout your adulthood, all of these things play a role in how an individual experiences them. So that might be why your girlfriend can have a piece of cake and just leave the rest alone. And you feel like you need to eat the whole thing. I am one of those individuals. That's why I just stay away from it. So it is very rare. Let's see. Now we talked about that. Um, so, but I just want to lay this down that the problem can be resolved regardless of how long or how often you have been practicing emotional eating. I've worked with people in their seventies who have overcome problems with emotional eating and addictive eating behaviors. So it's, there's no expiration date. So the best strategy is ultimately prevention, of course, when it comes to both cravings and emotional eating. When we figure out what we're feeling, we can figure out exactly what we need. We don't just have to default every emotion to eating some kind of hyperpalatable food. Yes, it seems like it's helpful in the moment, but eventually it creates more problems and it's the problem itself always surfaces again. It's like putting a bandaid on the, um, on the issue. So mindfulness and meditation and also journaling can build self-awareness around determining whether we are hungry or whether we are in need of some kind of emotional comfort. So some steps to addressing emotional eating. These are called the three Ds, and this is taken from the work of Dr. Vera Tarman and Clarissa Kennedy, some addiction specialists, where I actually um, got certified in this um, field. So this is to determine, distract, and derail. You can use this every time that you are dealing with emotional eating tendencies. So determine is determine whether you're physically hungry or emotionally hungry. Uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but obviously physical hunger is going to have a lot to do with regular, whether you're eating regular meals and how satisfying each of those meals are, how well balanced they are. So making sure you're getting plenty of starch at each meal is going to be your best friend, getting enough fiber and water in those meals. Um, or emotionally hungry, whether you just ate. So obviously you can't be hungry, like truly hungry, and you need to recognize the, the differentiation. And then we are going to distract. So this can be a five minute exercise or distraction to exit the habit loop and de-escalate. Again, we're just trying to build some space, some five minute, you know, periods of time where you just take a step back and you think, am I really hungry? Do I really want to act in this, act out this behavior or do I need to, you know, act in a more healthful manner that's gonna serve me better? Emotions are fleeting and eventually resolve on their own. Always remember that. That's a great tool or um, a great uh, reminder to keep in your back pocket. So the last one is derail or de-stress. Uh, the experience, experience the emotion and all its discomfort while working through it in a healthful manner. We don't want to run from our emotions. We want to understand them and uh, work through them because it, once it starts, it, it has to be completed. It's not something where you can just ignore forever and it won't manifest in different areas of your life in a negative way. It's going to need to be, you know, acknowledged and processed. So some helpful ways of working through this is exercise, calling a friend, taking a hot bath, journaling, whatever works for you. There's a million different ways to care for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we are all trying to reach food serenity. So the goal is to practice healthy habits that support a well-managed emotional system. So a comprehensive approach of getting proper sleep, stress management, supportive relationships, quality time in nature, and so on. Uh, turning to food to resolve our emotions occurs when something is internally out of balance and when we have an abundance of these hyperpalatable processed foods in our environment. Emotional eating is just like cravings. This is a learned behavior. It can be unlearned the same way we change any habit with objective awareness, a solid plan of correction, and due diligence while maintaining a healthy lifestyle on those other fronts. Okay, 
So if anybody feels that they do need some additional support around these issues, I work with people in a number of different capacities. I have my naturally lean students who are actually running through my spring session of my masterclass right now. So my next one will be offered probably this fall. If you want updates on that, you can subscribe to my email list. I give out weekly newsletters. I also offer private coaching. If anybody needs one-on-one -on -one assistance, I typically work for them on a 90-day basis to really get to the root of those, um, those barriers to living a healthy lifestyle. Um, there is my food pusher response guide. This is a free tool for anybody who's having issues with um, carrying out a healthy lifestyle in social situations. Anybody who has gone to a party and has to try to explain why they don't want that piece of cake or why they don't want those burgers or whatever, this will help to provide you with an assertive and tactful response. There's like 26 of them, I believe, on this um, on this guide. And lastly, uh, you can find me on my YouTube channel, as Eileen mentioned, Naturally Carly, where I give plenty of tips and tricks on living a healthy whole food plant-based lifestyle for weight loss and management and health in general. All right, let me stop sharing. All right, Eileen. Hello, hello. Let me add pin here, make sure we're both on. So I learned so many things. I'm, I'm just, I'm in awe of what you just shared because you covered so many amazing things that people really need to know um, for success right? For one thing, I love the term food serenity. <laughs> so many people have these negative connotations around food because they've struggled, right? They struggle with their weight. They struggle with the emotional eating. They struggle with the cravings. So food to them is not serenity. It's stress, right? It's these mm -hmm. real negative things that sets them up into that sympathetic nervous system mode. You know, let's run from the bear. Let's run from the food, right? So I love that term. Um, just a couple of quick things I wanted to comment on. These are like my takeaways. I love the craving versus desire. That's wonderful because yeah, it's not a craving if you're desiring something that's really good for you, right? <laughs> I mean, that's okay. I just love that. And then the looks versus feels. So when, when you get that picture in your head, you know, it's kind of that joke, you know, if, if a bird wants to land on your head, you don't let them build a nest, you get rid of them. So you get that, that thought, right? You start thinking of how it looks, get rid of the thought before you start to experience how it feels. I love right. Exactly. Good. Strategy. I love that. I just love that. So, and then I just wanted to confirm this when it comes to the cravings, it's really a good idea to not try to reduce how many times you eat something that's bad for you. It's a good idea to just attempt to eliminate it completely because the cravings aren't going to go away until it's completely gone, right? So this is very controversial because people are so intimately connected to their food yes. and nobody wants to give up their comfort foods. Right. But the wonderful right. thing is healthy foods can be comforting too. It, but yeah. it's very difficult to get there if you're still overpowering them with these artificial man-made foods that were created in a lab somewhere to, you know, make us respond in such unnatural ways. So yeah, good. I'm, I'm yeah, glad yeah. you really And of course, a lot of people think that, you know, some really healthy foods are not healthy because of all the inaccurate information out there, right? Like you can make a really healthy big bowl of mashed potatoes and, and it can be really good for you depending on how you prepare them, right? So um, yeah. we have our comfort foods. It's okay, right? But it depends on the person. I like how you said that. It's unique and individual to them, right? They're craving. That's, their, that's yeah. the underlying principle yeah. is that you need to know yourself and you need to know if you're one of those people that can have a little something once in a while and yeah. not let it overpower your quality of life, Correct. not let it impact right any other air aspect of your life. Right. So like if, trigger thing. Yeah. Right. But if you're somebody who is impacted, if you are constantly noticing that you're preoccupied with those cravings, just get rid of it and see it, see how it feels. See that you can survive. You're not going to, yeah. yeah. you know, yeah. a few yeah. weeks down and the road. I, I love the plan, right? When X happens, I do Y. So mm -hmm. I was getting into a, an unhealthy habit in the evenings um, you know, still sticking with the whole food plant-based type thing, but they weren't really the healthiest choices. And so I realized, well, okay, when I start to have that craving, I'm going to do something different, right? So I started 
doing different things like um, a big pot of chamomile tea. So, because it was kind of like, it was almost like this, this oral thing that I wanted. I wanted to be putting something in my yeah. mouth. While I was watching a Hallmark movie, right? So, so it's the cup of chamomile tea. So I can just keep sipping on it. And by the time I'm done with that pot of tea, my stomach's full. I don't have any cravings for anything. So, so, but I love that the, the, when X happens, I do Y that's beautiful. And then the last thing I wanted to ask you about, and we did have that one question, but I think you answered her question throughout your presentation. Um, but if the case there's anything you want to add, but um, the one thing I wanted to ask about is, would you know about this um, because of your, your training? This Is it the same stresses, right, that lead to emotional eating that can also increase chronic pain because of that sympathetic nervous system overload that we get stuck in? And oh, that's a great connection. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And then yeah. the sympathetic nervous system, which is the, the heal and repair and the digestive process, right? So maybe that emotional eating is connected to, as you had said, numbing the body and, and, and like kind of attending that emotion with food. Maybe that's a body's innate desire to get out of the sympathetic and into the parasympathetic because their body is sure. focusing on digestion. Yeah, a lot of these foods stimulate, you know, the release of serotonin. So that's very understandable yeah. when it comes to somebody who's experiencing extreme pain all day, that's exhausting and extremely yeah. stressful. So yeah. I can very much imagine somebody drifting towards these more hyper palatable items towards, mm -hmm. especially towards, you know, the end of their day yes. when their pain is probably at its highest and their ability to deal with any more stress is just like maxed out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Okay. And I love that you we're gonna I just want everybody to know, we are going to put all of the links for everything that Carly mentioned, you're going to have a link directly to get that food push and response guide, you can you can contact her. Um, actually, it says sign up for a free consultation. So you'll do a little bit of a connection with people to see if you're a good fit, I'm assuming and, and yes, kind of thing. Yep. Yeah, yeah, there has to be that um, compatibility with, with yes. the people yes. that I work yes. with. I agree. Not I always, yeah, I always have a phone conversation with people before I schedule a consultation as well, because there may be other resources or things I can aim them at that are a better fit than me. So, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. And sometimes it's just helpful to get it out and talk to somebody about it. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. All right. Well, I am so grateful that you're here. And um, I, I just know this is going to help a ton of people. And I hope that lots of people contact you and sign up for your YouTube channel. And um, for those of you who might be interested, I did do a guest spot on Carly's channel for my expertise. So if you go to her channel, you'll, you'll find that too. But um, thank you so, so much. And, uh, and we will be having another, another topic, right, very soon. So thank you, thank you. And um, I look forward to the next time. Yeah, thanks so much, Eileen. It was great.